Welcome to RWM Blue Water Ministry. My name is Bob Manuk, and uh, today's teaching is the first part of a series where we're going to do a five part series on the Holy Spirit. And before I get into it, I guess uh, I want to give some reasons actually why, why I'm doing this. Uh, you know, in a lot of ways, I mean, we, we, in, in, the, in the Christian church, there's many denominations. And each denomination has kind of its own flavor. And uh, you know, I can remember, I can remember as a child uh, when my parents sent me to Sunday school uh, for a, a, a small season in one of the mainline churches. And I can remember being in a Sunday school class, and we we had a teacher, and there maybe it was eight of us around the table, eight year olds, nine year olds, something like that. And and the teacher was reading Bible stories for us. And I suppose at one point she said, uh, does anybody have any questions? And, and I, I raised my hand and I said, the, you know, we're reading the stories in the Bible that's talking about miracles happening. Jesus is doing miracles and the disciples were doing miracles. And uh, so I asked the question, I, why don't we see miracles today? Because even at eight years old, I, I had learned that there are people today who are blind. There are people who are lame. Uh, there are people in wheelchairs. So I said, why, why don't we see that today? And she said to me that the reason we don't see it, see it today is because miracles died out with the disciples. And, uh, you know, quite honestly, I, 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 found that, <laughs> I found that to be an unacceptable answer. Because I'm thinking, well, if, if somehow God reached down and did miracles 2,000 years ago, but somehow uh, we weren't good enough to, for him to work miracles amongst us. Like it somehow just didn't seem reasonable. It just didn't seem right. And uh, I ended up one of my mom and saying, I go to school five days a week. I don't want to go on Sundays too. And she allowed us not, not to go to Sunday school anymore. And, uh, but that, but that was kind of, a, that was my first idea. And, and I'll tell you, as, as time went on, um, once I became a Christian and realized that uh, uh, there are some aspects to the Holy Spirit that not all the churches agree on. So about 120 years ago, I mean, there was suddenly a, a revival that happened uh, on Azusa Street, and, and it was the, the Holy Spirit fell, and people were speaking in tongues like what the Bible talks about. And, uh, and then that spread to other places, and, and when some of the mainline denominations started getting that gift of the Holy Spirit, and with baptism of the Holy Spirit, and with miracles and signs and wonders following, uh, so these churches then were uh, either called Pentecostal churches, uh, or or when the mainline churches they were they were called charismatic churches, and uh, so suddenly you had a, a divide. You had some of these charismatic churches that were experiencing the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You had the mainline churches, uh, the traditional churches that had not had that experience and therefore did not accept it as a valid experience. So suddenly you've you've got this great divide going on, and. Uh, so, so, anyway, um, I know that uh, it, was, it was about six, eight months ago, I, I was able to have lunch one day with uh, uh, this um, Baptist man who uh, at the, was currently selling life insurance, but had you know, formerly been a Baptist pastor at leading a church. And uh, so anyway, he, uh, we, we were having lunch together, and, and you know, uh, being a Baptist pastor, he, I mean, and, you know, Baptists are good people. They, they know their Bible. They take it seriously, and they, they, they pray, and they believe God, and, and, and so they, they are evangelical. They want to win people for the Lord. Good people, you know, but uh, traditionally, they don't accept any teachings on the, or at least generally on the Holy Spirit. So he, even being a Baptist pastor, he knew nothing about tongues, and we're out having lunch, and he asked me the question. He says, so do you believe, and they said use as in we Pentecostals, uh, do you believe that uh, if you don't have tongues you're not saved? <laughs> I said, absolutely not, no, no. Um, the Apostle Paul said, uh, I, I, I wish that you all could speak in tongues, but well, that implies that not everybody was speaking in tongues, and that had nothing to do with salvation. So, you know, we had that. Uh, just about a month or two ago I was talking to this couple in our church who was going to meet with another couple who had moved into the community and they were kind of seeking out a church 
but they were didn't want to actually come to our church because well we're a Pentecostal church and it has to do with the Holy Spirit and tongues, and and so there are just people who have concerns about that. And anyway, hence all that. You know what? Um, I'm going to do a five-part series talking about the Holy Spirit. If you want to know what the Bible says about it, um, then this is going to be a good place to uh, to, to get exposed to uh, what this is all about. I do want to say, you know, sometimes people uh, comments I have feedback I've gotten back on my teachings is that sometimes um, they're overlong, sometimes they might be a little bit boring, uh, sometimes I use too many Bible references, and okay, and you know what? And I'm gonna I'm gonna confess, I try not to uh, present my opinions uh, as a major part of of these programs. Uh, you know, I might from time to time give my interpretation of what we read, but generally speaking, I want you on any subject, I want you to be presented with the Word of God. I've pulled out scriptures that on any given topic, I want you to understand, this is what the Word says. Based on the Word, form your own opinion of, of what you think it says. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll just, I'll guide you through what the Bible says, and, and so therefore how some of us come, come to these conclusions what the logic is in it, but, but I'm going to present the Word of God, and I'm going to present a significant portion of the Word of God so that you can come up with a, your own valid conclusions. So, I would suggest get a piece of paper and pen out. Uh, get ready to start writing down scriptures as, as we present the teaching, uh, because um, we are going to present the Word of God, and, if, and, and, and I'm going to suggest that not only do you hear this teaching, but go back now and get a modern day language Bible and uh, look up these scriptures on your own time and, and see if if you conclude the same thing as, as I've concluded. You know? And uh, anyway, so um, as I said, we're going to do a five-part teaching. Today, part one, the title of the message is The Promise of the Holy Spirit. Uh, next time in part two, we're going to look at the deposit of the Holy Spirit. In part three, we'll be looking at the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Part four, we'll be receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then part five, we'll, we'll be looking at the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So, um, we will uh, begin our lesson right now. And uh, allow me, just very quickly, let's just start our teaching with a word of prayer that God lead us and guide us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for uh, giving us revelation through your word, Lord. Uh, and we just, we just thank you for, for your word and, and, and that, that we have it in our, our own language, that we can read it and study it and understand it. And we just pray now, Lord, that you would just lead us and guide us and help us to interpret what it is you intended for us to understand. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, today... Part 1, Promise of the Holy Spirit. And the first we see the Holy Spirit mentioned in Scripture is in the second verse of the Bible. Genesis 1, uh, chapter 2. So we're going to read verse 1 and 2. Uh, this is, has to do with the account of the creation. So verse 1, very first Bible, first, first verse of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 2. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. The Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. So that was second verse of the Bible, mentioning the Spirit of God. Okay, in, uh, in the book of Numbers, uh, chapter 28, 18, now the first five books of the Bible were written by Moses, and, and that was after he brought the Hebrews out of Egypt, and, and they were in a tent, and he was meeting with God. And, and, and so all these writings, the first five books of the Bible came out. Uh, they were written around uh, 1400 B.C. And uh, anyway, so Numbers 27, verse 18. So the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua, son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay your hand on him. Now, uh, there's some ver uh, versions of the Bible that says, uh, Take Joshua, son of Nun, a man in whom is the spirit of leadership, 
and lay a hand on them. So we're at a point right there where uh, they're about to go into the promised land. Moses is, is an old man. He's, he's going to die. And God has instructed him. Uh, in fact, Moses asked, oh, well, let, let us, who's going to take over for me? Who's going to lead the people on in the promised land? And that's where he said, Joshua, son of Nun. He has a spirit of leadership on him. Lay your hand on him. And, and the point of laying your hands on him was the transferring of authority. And, uh, uh, and, and in front of the assembly of, of, of God's people, so that they would recognize that Joshua is the one who has been anointed to lead them into the promised land. In Deuteronomy chapter 34 verse 9, uh, this is actually speaking around the same, the same subject. Now Joshua son of Nun was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses laid his hands on him. So uh, the point of looking at all these scriptures we're going to look at today is uh, we're talking about the promise, the promise of the Spirit, but we're also looking at uh, characteristics, anointings, things that things that the that the Spirit brings when He uh, upon people. So we've already seen that there's a spirit of leadership, there's a spirit of wisdom. Now these are uh, it's only one Spirit, but these are different giftings, anointings that that He will bring to people based on what they need. Um, so now, one of the minor prophets later on in the Bible is, is the book of Joel. And uh, it was written around 600 years before the birth of Christ. Uh, it's, it's called the day of the Lord. Verse 28 uh, to 32. And it says in verse 28, And afterward, so this is God speaking through the prophet, says, Afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Uh, and your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And you see there he says, on my servants, both men and women. You know, people talk about the, the, the Jewish tradition and, 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 a, and a lot of ancient days where it was a very uh, uh, patriarchal, uh, community environment uh, and yet God said I will pour out my spirit on both men and women and uh, but he's talking here about the gifts he said I'll pour out my spirit there'll be prophecies there'll be dreams there'll be visions these are things that the spirit's going to bring and he's saying that a day will come I will pour out my spirit that day is going to come I will pour out my spirit in those days and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved so that was a prophecy uh, given by the prophet Joel. Uh, it's talking about it, a day is coming. So uh, in the book of Matthew, which is uh, uh, the first book of the New Testament, um, <clears throat> Matthew 3.16, this is speaking of Jesus. After his baptism, as, so this is when, when Jesus was in the Jordan with John the Baptist, and he got baptized in the water and come out of the water. After his baptism, as Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and settling on him, settling on Jesus. So the Spirit of God came down and descended on Jesus. And it looked like a dove. Matthew uh, chapter 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So, Jesus was led by the Spirit. Now I want to say, okay, so some of the things that the Spirit does, we, we've already said, the, the characteristics, Spirit can, can give a spirit of, of leadership, a, a, a spirit of wisdom. Um, here we're seeing that the Spirit led Jesus. The Spirit led Jesus out into the wilderness. These are some of the things that the Spirit does. He'll lead you. He'll, and we'll, we'll hear some of the other things that they brings to you. But we'll also see here where um, he was led, led out to be tempted by the devil. So these are the things the devil does. The devil is always wanting to stop the work of God. He's always going to be trying to tempt you uh, so that you will not uh, follow after the Word of God and, and allow... Um, um, God's will to be done in your life. He wants to tempt you and drag you away from the path of righteousness. So the devil's going to tempt. He tempted Jesus, he'll tempt you. If you're trying to 
follow after Jesus. The book of Mark, uh, uh, chapter 2, verse 68. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, and they're speaking of Jesus, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. Jesus knew in his spirit. So uh, later on, we're going to hear about uh, the gifts. Um, and and, and, and one, of the, one of the gifts is the gift of knowledge. I mean, they're just suddenly knowing things that you wouldn't necessarily have any ability to know, but the spirit gives you revelation. So immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking. In the book of Luke 3.16, John the Baptist answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So again, he's prophesying there's a time coming. Joel, what, 600 years before the birth of Christ, prophesied that there will be a day coming when I'll pour out my spirit. And now here, here John the Baptist is. Uh, he's, you know, Jesus, he's about to baptize Jesus, which we just heard about. But he'll baptize, and he says, the one who's coming will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And the fire, of course, signifies that cleansing. That cleansing of, like, I mean, if, you, if, you, if you put the fire to gold, it, it burns off all the dross and the impurities, and you end up with a pure gold. And the same thing is when the Holy Spirit of fire comes upon you, I mean, it will burn off the sin in you. It, 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 all the things that uh, corrupt you, it, it, it will, the fire will purify. He says, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit and fire. Luke 4, uh, uh, Luke 4, 16, verse 19. So he, talking about Jesus, he went up to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me. And so again, underline, the Spirit of the Lord, the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He's talking about bringing freedom. People are <laughs> held captive by sin. And he says, I've come. The Spirit of God is on me. I am anointed. And I've come to set people free. <gasps> ah. John 4, 24. And it says, God is spirit. And his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. So what he's saying here is that we who want to follow after God, uh, God is spirit. And we need to worship him in spirit and in truth. John 7, 37, 39. On the last and greatest day of the festival, which this was the festival of shelters, one of the Jewish festivals, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. So again, we're talking about the Spirit. Um, and and the, the title of this message is The Promise of the Spirit. And that's what we've looked at from, from the beginning. The Spirit of, of God was hovered over the earth. Joel said the day is coming when, when uh, God will pour out his Spirit on all flesh, uh, his sons and daughters, all those who belong to God. Here, uh, they're saying, uh, Jesus is saying, anybody who believes in me, rivers of living water will flow. Uh, and he was talking about the Spirit. He was talking about the Spirit. You will flow from within as the Spirit uh, does its work in you. Um, so John 14, verse 15 17. Again, Jesus speaking. If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father... And he will give you another advocate. And uh, 
It's another word for advocate is one who's going to support you and lead you, defend you. I will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. So that's what he's saying. He said, he said, when I go to the Father, I will give you another advocate. I will give you the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him uh, nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. So again, it's a future sense, but he says he's with you, but he will be in you. So he's talking about the spirit of truth. And again, we're talking about the promise of the Holy Spirit. And, and Jesus is preparing his disciples. He's saying, I have to go away. But when I do, I'm sending uh, the spirit of truth, who will be your advocate. And he will do all the things for you that he's done for me. He will lead me. He will give me knowledge. Uh, he will lead me into all truth. And, uh, and we can trust in him. John 14, verse 26. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things. So he's going to teach you. And will remind you of everything I have said to you. The Holy Spirit, I mean, so here's some of the things. If you're a Christian today, uh, we encourage you always to read the Bible, get the Word into your heart. J David said, I have hidden, your Word I have hidden in my heart so I might not sin against you. If you understand the Word, then you won't be making mistakes. Uh, it will lead you. It will be a lamp under your feet. It will guide you. And he's saying here that if you get the Word in you, um, and, and go ahead, how do we get it? How do we get the Word of God? By reading the Bible. Get the, get the words of the Bible into our heart. Because Jesus says, the Holy Spirit is going to remind you of everything I told you. Well, that's valid for the disciples, the disciples who heard him speaking, but they've written down the record. And so uh, here we are 2,000 years later. It's not, like we're going to, it's not like we sat at Jesus' feet and heard him speaking, but we have his word, which is the Bible, and if we get it in our hearts, and, uh, and what he's saying here, the Spirit will remind you of everything I said and, uh, and will teach you all things. John 16, verse 13. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. So he's going to give you, do a foretelling. He will show you things that are, are yet to come. Matthew 10, verse 1. Jesus called his twelve disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. So let me say this right now. You know, I mean, we, <laughs> some people struggle to think, well, did Jesus really exist and was he really the Son of God? Well, not only did he exist, he was working miracles and he did teachings and he promised, he talked about the Holy Spirit that's going to come. But there's also the, 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 the Bible records, that it says, I let him out into the desert to be tempted of the devil. The devil, the record shows that, that uh, uh, the devil was kicked out of heaven. He used to be an angel, but he led a rebellion against God, and him and one third of the angels were kicked out of heaven. And so they are in the atmosphere. Uh, the devil is a, is a real, per, well, fallen angel. Uh, who is the leader of the, of the rebellion, and all those fallen angels are demons that uh, will whisper. Uh, they'll send thoughts into people's minds. And, uh, you know, in, in, in Ephesians, it talks about the armor of God. One of the pieces of armor is the shield of faith that extinguishes the flaming arrows of the evil one, who will put thoughts in your mind, who will lie to you. And now, these, these thoughts and lies are sometimes when you hear the self voice that says you're no good you'll never uh, match uh um you know you'll never you never rise up to the occasion of what's required here you, you're just a failure you can't do it you, you the, the world would be better off without you your family would be better off without you you're just a failure and and you, you shouldn't even be breathing you know and, and he's, the bible the, the devil will lie 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 and it says he's a liar uh, he, he steals kills and destroys we have the Word that's in us and the Word of God that tells us that we are valuable and He died for us. Therefore, um, you know, so when we're talking about Jesus and the Holy Spirit, and He talks about, uh, he's given, He gives us a, a, a disciples the authority to drive out impure spirits, to drive them out, uh, to get them away. It says, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Uh, 
So he gave him authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. So when the spirit of truth comes upon us, uh, and he says, I'll give you authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. There are those who teach that this authority ceased after the death of the apostles, but that is not what the scriptures teach us. So, <clears throat> this is Jesus teaching his disciples. Um, Matthew 10, 1. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles, uh, but when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. So again, um, the Holy Spirit is going to come and help us to be witnesses. Uh, and, when, and, and, and when it says to uh, governors and kings, well there's leaders, you know, a lot of us, most of us probably are never going to call, be called up to talk to our governors and prime ministers and, and, and whatever. Um, but it says, and to the Gentiles. <coughs> Some scriptures would call that, and to other unbelievers. So in other words, we, we, we're surrounded by unbelievers. And if we ever have an opportunity to share with them the truth of the gospel, uh, the Bible is saying the Holy Spirit will help us and will speak through us. <coughs> and I'll tell you what, you know what? There, there is no greater joy to have shared the gospel with somebody and uh, know that God's anointing was upon you and that he gave you words to say. You'll, you'll wonder where did those words come from. Like, actually, that, that was good. What, the things that were shared, that was good. Where did that come from? Well, it was the Holy Spirit speaking through you. There is no greater delight. So he says, uh, therefore, uh, actually this is in, in Matthew, uh, Matthew 28, verse 18, 20. Uh, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, and he's saying this to the disciples, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So that was, uh, this is uh, known as uh, the Great Commission, you know, where Jesus commissioned the disciples to go out and make disciples, teaching them, okay, make disciples, baptizing them, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And part of that obeying is go out and witness and make disciples. So the anointing of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit that's going to help you be a witness, it isn't just for the disciples because they were commanded to go out and make disciples who will then go out and do these things also and do everything that Jesus commanded to obey. So through the ages, you can see that the, the, the need for the Holy Spirit to give you power to witness and to give you the words to speak it wasn't just for the initial disciples. It was for them to teach other disciples who will then need that same help to go out and witness and, be, and make disciples. And he says, I'll be with you to the end of the age. Luke 24, 49. And now, this is again Jesus speaking, and now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my Father promised. But stay here in the city, because they're, they're at that current time in Jerusalem. Stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. So that's what he's directing. He says, you know, Jesus has been telling him, like, I'm going, I'm going away, I'm going to be with the Father, but I'll send the Holy Spirit. He said, so you guys stay in the city, stay in Jerusalem until, uh, now, now I will, he says, I will send the Holy Spirit just as my Father promised, but stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes. And he will fill you with power. So, in Acts 1, verse 4 and 5, on one occasion, while he, Jesus, was eating with them, he gave them this command. Again, he says, do not leave Jerusalem. Now, and, and let me just put in Acts, this is after Jesus was crucified, died, raised again, he was alive. And so, this is what, you know, he's, he's, he's risen. And this is what he's speaking to his disciples. Um, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift 
my father promised, the gift, the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So this is what we're talking about, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Um, and this is, that was the promise that he said the Father, the Father promised it. He promised it back in Joel. He's promised it when, when, you know, when, when John the Baptist there, and Jesus through his ministry has been talking to his disciples about the, the promise that's coming. That there's going to be an advocate. Uh, and then Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And then you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, when people say uh, all the giftings and the miracles that, that came, uh, that Jesus gave the, the disciples authority to, and it says, but they, they died with the disciples. Well, all right, let, let me suggest to you, Jesus would not give the disciples a command that they could not achieve, that they could not be successful at. He, he wouldn't give them something that, that it was impossible for them to do. And what he said there was, you will receive power and the Holy Spirit comes on you, and then you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Okay, they could achieve that because that's where they were. And in all Judea. Okay, well, once, once the power comes upon them, they can travel and they can get to Judea. And it says, and in Samaria. So some of them would even get to Samaria. All right, they can achieve that. And to the ends of the earth. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. okay. These guys traveled on foot. There is no way these guys can make it to the ends of the earth. And, uh, but that's why he said, go and make disciples. Go, you know, you're going to have power to be witnesses, and you're going to go and make disciples. You're going to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And you're going to teach them to obey everything that we've told you to do, so that they then will go out to the outer ends of the earth and with power to be witnesses and make disciples. But the only way they could do that is if they had the power of the Holy Spirit upon them. So all I'm suggesting based on that is Jesus wouldn't give them a command that they couldn't achieve. How are they going to achieve uh, getting to the ends of the earth? With the help of the Holy Spirit and passing that on to the other disciples. I'm saying uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the mirror working power of the Holy Spirit did not die with those original twelve. They, had, they passed it on to other disciples and taught them. And, 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 and we'll see that in the scriptures that we're going to look at to come. So, <clears throat> the following is the scriptural record of the coming of the Holy Spirit. So, in Acts, chapter 1, verse 12 to 15. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. So just before this, Jesus ascended into heaven, and they saw him go, and they knew he was gone. So now they, they came back to, this, to Jerusalem uh, from the Mount of Olives, a distance of about half a mile. When they arrived, they went to the upstairs room of the house where they were staying. They, were all, they all met together and were constantly united in prayer. So this is a number of days that they're just up there and... They're praying, uh, you know, so they do the things you need to do. They're, they go out shopping, get some food in, they come in, they, they eat, and they're in prayer. And uh, they all met together, were constantly united in prayer, along with Mary, the mother of Jesus, several other women, and the brothers of Jesus. During this time, about 120 believers were together in one place. Now we will jump over to chapter 2. And this is called, The Holy Spirit Comes at Pentecost. And this is where anytime you hear Pentecostals, they're talking about this. The day of Pentecost is when the, 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 the gift of the Holy Spirit came. Chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, and then let me just say that. Pentecost, uh, in the Greek, Pente, Pente is 50. So uh, when Jesus was crucified, it was, on, on the, it was the Passover celebration of the Jews. It was during the Passover. Uh, Pentecost is simply 50 days after the the Passover. So when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Now 
understand that. It says the sound like the blowing of a violent wind. So like I mean, uh, you've heard I've heard people talk about being near tornadoes that came through. They said it sounded like a train coming through. Like, like there was a noise, and it filled. Uh, uh, it came from heaven. It filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest. So there was a tongue on each one of them. Tongues of fire on each one. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues uh, as the Spirit enabled them. You know, some translations say in other languages. Uh, and it says, and everyone present, everyone, everyone present, 120 people in that upper room, everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. Verse 5, now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, this great violent wind, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Verse 14, then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews, and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I have to say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Remember earlier we read Joel, 600 years before the birth of Christ, he said, and the, the Spirit of the Lord will come and pour out on sons and daughters. And this is what he said. This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my Spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, will be saved. Later, and he kept on preaching, later when people were convicted by Peter's words, they asked, what should they do? And Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive, <coughs> you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise Okay, so get this. This is what Peter's saying. Under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, he says, The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And I'm going to suggest to you, <laughs> that includes us. That includes us 2,000 years later. He said, because, you know, here he is talking to all these people in Jerusalem, and, and, and he's, he's preaching to the crowd. And he's saying, this promise is for you. So it wasn't just for the 12. And like there was 120 people in the upper room, and they all got baptized. The record shows 120 people got baptized, and they were speaking in other languages and tongues. So they all, they're all got baptized. They all received uh, languages. And, uh, and now Peter's preaching and saying, the promise is for you to this huge crowd. The promise is for you and your children. And I'm going to suggest that it's not just the children who might have been with them, but the children who aren't even born yet. Your children, and for all who are far off. In other words, not just for you, but for those in the next town, and the town after, the country, the country over, the, to the ends of the earth. All those who are far off, all whom the Lord will call. So therefore, um, all who the Lord will call suggests it's, going to, it's a gift for believers. It's not anybody can get this. If you are a believer in Christ, he says, be, uh, believe, be baptized, and, and, then, and then you'll get the gift. The gift is for you. 
So with many other words, this is verse 40, with many other words he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So understand, you, you had the 12 who were given authority to go and uh, be my witnesses. Uh, you know, you'll receive power and you'll, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Well, here he is now. 120 people were meeting in the upper room. All 120 people got filled. The, the, the wind, the howling wind, the fire, tongues of fire on each one of them. 120 people got filled with the Holy Spirit. They were speaking languages. And then Peter says, and you, the crowd here, the promise is for you and all those far off. And that day, 3,000 people were added to their number. Can you, you know, this right there was the explosion of the Christian church. That was the beginning of what Jesus started with his disciples and, and with the help of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit, the message was preached. 120 people got baptized. 3,000 and, and probably more than 3,000 came and heard the message. One presumes that there was a crowd. Maybe not everybody received the, the truth. But it says 3,000 people were added to their number. In other words, they got baptized and they believed. Jesus said, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and you will receive power to be my witness. That was Jesus' claim. That's what he told the disciples. And it happened. It happened. 120, then 3,000. 3,000 people became Christians that day. So this is, this is, the topic was the promise of the Holy Spirit. We looked at all the promises, uh, at least many of the pro promises. The promises, and, and, and not only the promise of what? The, the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the gifts that are going to come with it, to, to have power and to power to be witnesses and, and, and giftings and anointings that come with it. And uh, so that's, that's what it is. Um, so that was the promise. And um, so let me, let me just close in prayer. And Heavenly Father, as we've looked at these scriptures, and as the people who have heard this, if, if they open up their Bibles and they look at these scriptures again, Lord, I pray that by your Spirit you be with them and help them translate the word for them so, so that the word gets into their spirit. May it grant them revelation so that they can see truth, Lord. I pray that, Lord, by your power that you would speak to their hearts as they get into your word. Lord, that they can be led into all truth, that they'll accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, that they will uh, receive the promise that has been given to them. And uh, Lord, I just pray for each one that you will bless them. I pray for each one who is listening to this message. Bless them. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, <clears throat> join us next time when we will continue the Holy Spirit series, part two, the deposit of the Holy Spirit. I'm Bob Manuk, and this is RWM Blue Water Ministry declaring blessings on you and yours until we meet again. Remember, Jesus is coming soon. Amen.